Hi everyone. In today's installment of Programming for Lovers, we're going to examine the basics of strings in Go. We will then use what we learn about strings to solve a common problem in the analysis of genomes. Specifically, given the sequence of nucleotides along one strand of DNA, how can we determine the string of nucleotides running in the opposite direction on the complementary strand? If you enjoy what you see, please like, subscribe, and join our course at programmingforlovers.com. Let's code. To get set up, you'll notice that I've created a directory called strings within our GoSRC folder. And then within that directory, I've got a file named main.go, and I've got a little bit of starter code there for us as well. In this code along, we're going to be implementing a function called reverse complement that takes as input a string and that then returns the reverse complement of that string, assuming that it's a DNA string, meaning that it's going to be reversing the string as well as taking the complementary nucleotide at each position. And the key insight about how to write that function is that we can view those two tasks, reversing and complementing, as two separate independent tasks. So I will have one function that performs the complementary action that takes a string and returns the string in which each symbol has been replaced with its complementary nucleotide, A with T and vice versa, G with C and vice versa. And then I'll have a separate function called reverse that simply takes in a string and reverses the symbols of the string, which is a separate task. But when I put those two functions together, I get what I desire, which is the reverse complement. More on that in a bit. For now, we need to learn a little bit more about the basics of working with strings in Go. So the first thing that I would point out is that Go has a built-in function called string that often converts things into strings. So for example, you might imagine that we would like to convert the symbol A into a string, and we'll print that to the console. Or perhaps we would like to print the integer 45 converted to a string to the console. And we can save that and navigate into the appropriate directory in a terminal. Here I'm already in Go, so I'm just going to navigate into src strings and compile and then run with dot slash. And you might have anticipated that what would get printed would be A on one line followed by the string 45 on another line. But instead what we see printed is this dash symbol. So that might be somewhat confusing for now. And the reason why is because Go actually thinks about symbols as integers. This is something that we saw in a, in a previous code along, that there is a what's called the ASCII character table, and that there is a correspondence between symbols and integers. And so the integer 45 corresponds to this symbol that we saw got printed, this dash or hyphen. Now, the next thing that we would like to talk about is, all right, well, maybe we wanted to convert this number 45 to an actual string. And we're going to do this with an external package called string convert. So the package that we're going to need, if we would like this instead to print 45, is strconv. And that's a package that's going to be really helpful for us as we go through this course. Um, instead of what we did here, let's instead convert it using an appropriate function. So we're going to have a function called, and I'm going to print this, string convert dot integer to a string, i to a. And now we're going to give it 45. And when we give this 45, and I go into the terminal, hit up twice to get to go build, up twice again to run my strings command, um, I'm going to see 45 get printed, which is nice. That's what we had hoped to see. You can also go the other way. So you can convert not just integers to strings, but strings to integers using string convert. So I thought I would show you that quickly as well. So say for example, um, I wanted to convert a string to an integer and here the I and the A get switched in the function call. So instead of I to A, it's A to I. And say I gave it the string 37 and then I would like to print this and I'll go down and compile. And I don't even get past the compiler. So the issue here 
is that go protects our, ourselves from from misbehavior. In other words, you could potentially imagine that somebody would give this function a string that's not actually the string corresponding to an integer. I could give it the word high. And then were we to actually then execute this line of code, it would be unclear what action to really take. So Go prevents us from doing that by giving us a compiler error and making sure that we know how this works. In particular, how this works is that the compiler error tells us you only returned, you only have one variable, but the function returns two values. And so the two values that it returns are j, in this case, what you want it to, what you want the conversion of the string to be. But also you're going to get a, a special variable having error type. And so that's going to get returned by the function too. So the function returns two things. And I'm going to call the, the variable corresponding to that second return error variable ERR. And then the idea is, is that Go would like us to make sure that everything was all right. Okay. And everything is okay. So the conversion is okay when the error variable is equal to a special value nil. And much later, when we talk about object-oriented programming in Go, we'll talk about more about nil. But for now, just know that when you're doing some process and you get an error variable as a second variable, if that variable is equal to nil, then you know that things have, have gone well for you. So you can check. Is it the case that it's equal to nil? And in particular, I want to check if it's not nil. This would be a problem happened. And if that's the case, maybe in this case, I'm going to panic and give it that error variable as an input. So that this time, when I try to do this nasty business of plugging in the string high, I'm going to catch that error because it's not going to be equal to nil. This will not have a nil value. And I'll show you that by compiling and then running. So it has a panic, string convert A to I, parsing high, invalid syntax. So it gave me the appropriate message and it handled that automatically. Um, let's not do that then. Let's give it something that's a little bit better. Let's give it, say, the string 23. And now when I save this, that parsing should have worked. So I'll save, compile, and run, and I see that the string 23 gets printed after I print J. So all is well and good there. You might wonder also about parsing decimals. And yes, we can parse decimals too. So the example that I would give you is pi, um, let's say, error 2 as a new error variable. I'm going to parse as a float, a string. And parse float takes two inputs. It's going to take the string that you want to parse. So in this case, we're going to give it the string version of the value of pi. As we all know, that's 3.14. And then we're going to also give it uh, another parameter corresponding to the precision or how, how large of a variable we want it to be. So we have typically worked with float 64s. That's another topic we would talk about on a later day. Um, and so we're going to tell it the integer value 64 because we want a float 64 variable to be stored as pi. And we do the same thing. So we need to check, um, was this process OK? So I'll copy my code down. If error 2 is not equal to nil, then we're going to panic based off of error 2. And otherwise, we're going to print the value of pi is pi. So I'll save, compile, and make sure that I call string convert .parse float, And now I can compile and run. So the value of pi is 3.14 gets printed. So that's a very important package to know about, especially one potential application that we, we will encounter is, for example, taking in parameters via the command line. So I want to run a program and also give it different parameters to my program. And those are going to need to get parsed out behind the scenes. So a little bit later, we'll talk about that specific application, and then string convert is going to be that much more relevant at that point in time. For now, I want to point out another couple of introductory facts about string concatenation, or about strings in particular, string concatenation. And let me declare a couple of strings. So um, I can declare any string with var 
the name of the string, in this case it's going to be s, and then equal to the string that we're interested in. So say hi. All right. There also is going to be a shorthand declaration. So I will use the shorthand declaration in practice of just colon equals. And this will automatically be able to infer that I'm talking about a string here. So we're going to have s is going to be equal to high, t is going to be equal to lovers, and I can concatenate these strings with a built-in operation represented by the plus symbol. So the plus symbol in most programming languages represents string concatenation, meaning that you're going to glue the two strings together. So let's declare another string to be equal to their concatenation, and then I'm going to print the result. So when I compile and run, I will see those two strings glued together. You'll notice that there was no space between them because there was no space in either one of the strings. So they are truly glued together without any additional space. If you wanted to have that space, well, you could perhaps add that here as a space. And so you can have as many concatenations as you like in the same way that you can add as many numbers as you like. So I'll go back and have that as just a concatenation of the two strings without the extra space, but I wanted to point that out. You might wonder, what is a string really? And there's a fancier way of putting it, but probably the cleanest way of starting to think about strings is just thinking of strings as arrays of symbols. In this, in particular, symbols that have type byte. In this way, we're going to be able to access the elements of a string in the same way that we would access the elements of an array or a slice. And so we're going to, for example, if we wanted to access the first symbol of our new string u and maybe print it out. I could say the first symbol of u is, well, I would access that symbol in the same way that I would access the first element of an array. Everything is zero indexed. And so I'll say u bracket zero. Okay, so I'll save and show you that. And then you say, well, how is the first symbol of u 72? And this is the same issue that we saw before. So um, if strings are arrays of symbols and symbols are represented behind the scenes actually as integers, then what this is telling you is the first symbol of the string is whatever the symbol corresponding to the integer 72 is in the character table. So if we want to print this out in a nicer fashion, we should simply convert it to a string and everything will be okay. So that now when I save and run, save, compile, and run, you'll get the first symbol of u is h. So that's good. You might wonder, well, okay, if the first symbol is represented by u of zero, the final symbol is going to be have index equal to the length of our string minus one. So I'll say the final symbol of u is, let's convert to a string of u of length of u minus one. So just as arrays with arrays, we index strings from zero up to the length of the string minus one. I will save that and compile and run. And we get the final symbol of u is s, which is good. One more thing that I would point out is that you can also check individual values of a string. So I might have something that says, right, if Let's say the symbol of u at position, or let's say the symbol of t at position uh, 2 is equal to, well, in this case, it's v. So let's check. Is it equal to v, lowercase v? Everything here is case sensitive. Then we're going to print the symbol at position 2 of t is Let's see, does that get printed? Well, if I look at t, 
L is at position zero, O is at position one, and lowercase v is at position two. So when I save, compile, and run, I'm gonna see that printed. If I change this, I made this note as an aside, but if I change that to a capital V, then you won't see that message printed. Because as I said, everything is going to be case sensitive. So you need to pay attention to whether you have a lowercase or an uppercase letter. I'll return that to lowercase for now. That's everything I wanted to talk to you about in terms of the basics of strings. For now, let's go back and implement our reverse complement function. And that reverse complement function is going to be one of the easiest functions that you ever write, in part because we're going to be using subroutines to help us, as I said. So I'll write the comment at the start of the function. The function is going to take as input a string pattern of DNA symbols. It returns what? The reverse complement of the string. It's, we're going to have a function. It's going to be called reverse complement. And then we're going to give it a pattern as a string. And I'm going to return a string too. So here, as we can see in the pseudocode, I'm simply going to return the product of reversing the string after taking the complementary nucleotide at every position. And that's all we're going to do. So sometimes it pays off to be lazy in programming. This is an idea I'm going to come back to later on in the course when we talk about planning larger programs and the value of laziness and delaying details until the end. But that's a subject for another day. For now, I can at least point out that we've separated this out into two independent tasks. And let's consider each of these tasks. So first, we're going to have a, a function called complement. And what it's going to do is it's going to take as input a string of called patterns of DNA symbols. And what it returns is the string uh, formed by complementing each position of the input string. So this is where A and T are complements and C and G are complements as well. So func complement pattern string, and we're going to return a string as well. Now we could, one of the things we might do is ensure that the string that we've plugged into this function actually consists of only A, C's, G's, and T's. That would be an important thing to do. And we could easily write, say, even a subroutine to do that and panic if there were any issue and print a, an error message that we want to work with A, C's, G's, and T's. That's an important thing to do, but I want to focus on the meat of this function in particular. And you might imagine how we would start to write a function like this. We could have a bunch of if statements and else statements and, and check um, as we range over the string, check each position. That's good. So I'll have four i ranging over DNA. That's a good starting point. And when, then we could check, is it the case that DNA of i is equal to a? And then check if it's equal, else if it's equal to c, else if it's equal to g, and so on. And we can get even get a little slicker here. So we can use what we learned about ranging to just check, and you're really just checking the current symbol. So we're checking is the current symbol of the string equal to A, C, G, or T. And that's, um, that's a nice way of doing it, but I want to use this particular function as a way of exemplifying what we call switch statements. So when you have a bunch of different cases and you're just checking which of the, the cases we're entering, oftentimes this is, you know, you have a lot of possibilities. This is, it's helpful to use what's called a switch statement here. It's often a little bit easier to read. Um, so you're going to take different actions based off of different cases. And so I will show um, how that works. So I'm going to switch based off of what the current symbol is. So based off of what that is, I'm going to have different cases. And so I'm just going to enumerate these cases with the word case, followed by what the value is I want to check. If it's A, I want to take a certain action. 
and in that particular case, um, maybe I want to take, I have DNA here and pattern here. Let's call it DNA. In that particular case, um, I'm going to have want to set DNA of I is equal to T. Okay, And then I'm going to have other cases too. So I'm going to have four different cases in case the symbol is C. I'm going to set DNA of I is equal to its complementary nucleotide G. If I'm considering G, I'm going to set DNA of I is equal to C. And in the case that we're, we have a T, then DNA of I is equal to A. Then switch statements, which are essentially a metaphor for like rail, railroad switching, that's where they come from. They also have a default case. And in the default case, here's where I'm just going to have my panic statement, where I'm going to check and make sure that um, everything here is A's, C's, G's, and T's, and I'm going to panic and say invalid symbol given to the complement function. So we're ranging over the string, we're changing appropriate symbols, changing A's to T's, T's to A's, C's to G's, and G's to C's, and then at the end of that we're going to return our string. And that all looks fine, but unfortunately when I, when I run this, after I save, I get compiler errors. And the compiler errors that I get, I get four different ones, here, 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 and here, are that I can't assign to DNA. And so the reason why I said we conceptualize strings as arrays of symbols, what they technically are, are read-only slices of symbols, read-only slices of bytes. What that means is that the read-only part means that you can't go editing individual symbols. In some languages, you might be able to do that. In Go, once you set a single symbol of a string, you're not able to edit individual symbols. You need to just create a new string. So in that particular case, um, that's what we're going to do. Now, that's not to say that you can't update a string. So for example, um, if I wanted to come up here and instead of saying setting s equal to high, or I, I declared it equal to high, I wanted to update that to yo. That's fine. I can change an entire string. Go just doesn't like us changing individual symbols. So down here, the question is how to fix it. And the way that we're going to fix it is we're going to create a new string called DNA2. So I'm going to have var DNA2 string or DNA2 colon equals empty string because that's going to have the same result. It will have the default value, which is just an empty string when we declare it. And then we're still going to have this switch statement where as we range over the DNA, we're going to switch based off the current symbol. And in the case A, the only difference here is I'll say, all right, instead of setting the symbol, I'm going to be building DNA2 as we go. And as we go, I'm going to take the existing DNA2 string and I'm going to concatenate the symbol that I want on the end. So I'm going to say it's equal to DNA2 plus T. So as I range over the DNA string, I'm going to be building the other string by concatenating on symbols as we go. And so I'll have the same notation down here, DNA2 equals DNA2 plus G. And here we're going to add on a C. And then in the fourth case, we're going to add on an A. All right. So we've got each of our four cases handled. As with arithmetical expressions, this is going to become tedious to type all these extra occurrences of your variable. So what we learned about arithmetical equations is that if you're just adding something on to an existing value, to an existing value and a sort in a variable, then you can use plus equals. And this is the exact same instance of that. So I will have plus equals instead of having to have DNA2 copied over each time. And then we're ready to run this. And when I save and compile, I'm not in the terminal, but when I am in the terminal and I compile, I'm going to get an invalid operation. So here we go back to the very strict typing of Go. 
And Go is not going to like you trying to concatenate a single symbol onto a string. Reason why is because those have mismatched types. In this particular case, it's easy to reconcile. I didn't want to concatenate the symbol T. I actually want to concatenate the string containing the single symbol T. Same thing for the other cases. And I'll convert those all into strings, save, and hopefully I'm done with compiler errors. Except for the fact that I didn't declare, didn't didn't define reverse yet. One other thing here is I didn't actually technically use I, so uh, that can go away as well. We now just need to write reverse. So before I write reverse though, I want to point out that this function is maybe not as as optimal a function as we could write. And this is somewhat of a precocious point for, for this level of the course, but it's also something to know when working with strings. And so I want to point it out now. That's that as we go through this, imagine that this was a, this was a long string. It was like a bacterial genome with 4 million letters. Well, that means that you're going to go through this, range through this, and you're going to have 4 million different concatenations. As you perform all of those concatenations, as the string gets longer, you're going to be each time you take your current string, you're going to be adding one symbol to the end of it, and then you're going to be creating basically a new string that is the copy of that string plus one symbol. All those millions of copies are okay when the strings are short, but as they start to add up, even though Go is a fast language, they're going to really slow down your program, and in a way that's going to be even noticeable. So let's see then how to fix this. The way that we're going to get around it is to, rather than do all these string concatenations, simplify this down by instead setting DNA2 to be a slice of symbols. And so DNA2 is going to be equal to, let's make a slice of symbols. And the slice of symbols that we need is going to have a length equal to the length of the input string. So that will do that. And then as we range over DNA and switch based off of the current symbol, we're now going to set the ith value of the slice that we created equal to the symbol that we're interested in. And now we're going to go back from a string to a symbol notation. I'll copy each of these down. And so we're in this case, we actually are setting individual elements of the slice. So if you really want to change individual values of your string that you're producing, Go just wants you to make a slice to do that. So I'll set these equal to the appropriate values. And then your question would be, yeah, but I made a slice. So I didn't actually have a string. DNA2 is not what I wanted. It's just a slice of bytes. But Go has a nice built-in function that's something that we saw at the start of this code along called string and we will have string of DNA2. So this will convert the slice of bytes to a string. And all that gets handled. So we only actually have one string. It's nice and memory efficient. And this is a nice way of working with strings in general. And that's it for the complement function. The only other thing I would say is, let's implement the reverse function as well. So I need a function. And reverse technically is going to take any old string. So it doesn't have to be a DNA string. It could be the string hello, and we want to reverse that too. So reverse takes as input a string pattern. And what is it going to return? It returns the reverse of this. That's a little bit reductive. So uh, the string formed by reversing the positions of all symbols in pattern. So reverse is going to take a string called pattern is input, it's going to return a string too. I'm going to return parse loop. All right. And I would even say, before I continue, you can use what you've learned to go ahead and build this function reverse if you would like. We learned a couple different ways of forming a new string, one with string concatenations, the other one that's a little bit more efficient 
is by forming a slice of symbols and then converting that slice later to a string. But you're more than welcome to pause here and try it yourself. I think it would be a great exercise. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to continue on. And I'm going to first, I'm, let's do it the fast way. I'm going to first declare a slice of bytes of the appropriate length, which in this case is the length of pattern. And then at the end, I eventually want to return this, this rev string converted, rev slice converted to a string. And now the trick of this function is that we want to range over the pattern and then we want to set reverse of i equal to something. And the question is, what is it that we need to set it equal to? It needs to be pattern of something. But the question is what? And this is an, a great example of in the course, and we'll probably see these sorts of things from time to time, of how often the barrier in terms of solving a problem is not un the understanding of what it is that we need to do or how we need to write the structure of this. We know that it needs to be a function called reverse and what the input types need to be, what the output types need to be, and we know we need to range over it. The barrier is that at the end of the day, we've got to notice the pattern here and do really basically a little bit of algebra. And if for some reason you just had a bad algebra class and didn't like your teacher or whatever, that it can be such an enormous barrier when it comes time to, to learning to program because this is the type of, of problem where you actually get to put into practice in your math class when you talked about how to notice patterns and then put those into, into the language of math. So that's what we're gonna do here. And we're gonna think about this, I'll think about it in general as if we're ranging over the symbols that we want to set. Um, you could range over pattern, you could range over rev, it's gonna be the same ranging because I'm just gonna be consulting I. If we think about the first, the initial, the position zero of this slice rev, I want that to be the very, very last symbol of pattern. I just hit my microphone. I want it to be the very last symbol of pattern. And I want the one at position one of rev to be the one at the final position of pattern minus one. So that would be at, at, if n is the length of pattern but at n minus two. And I want the position, this symbol at position two of rev to be the one at position n minus three. At three needs to correspond to the position at, at n minus four and so on. And the question is how to write that down into something that applies for an arbitrary i. You might think about that for a second if you want the, the practice. The answer, the way of doing it is to say, well, it's kind of like n minus one because when i is zero, we're at n minus one, but then each time we subtract something, we subtract a little bit more. So what we're actually subtracting is i. And if you think about some, act, some specific examples, then, and here you say, what is n? And here is the length of pattern. If you think about some specific examples, go back to what I was saying. Rev of zero is going to be pattern of n minus one minus i, so rev of zero is pattern of n minus one. Rev of one is pattern of n minus two. Rev of two is pattern of n minus three, and so on. And that's the, for lack of a better word, pattern that we notice. Okay. And that's the formula. There's another nice word, so I don't have to use the word pattern since it's in front of me. That's the formula that when you're considering position i, you're going to go into position n minus one minus i of the input string and access that for rev. At the end of this, we're just gonna convert that slice that we have into a string and we're going to be done. So we've written our complement function, we've written our reverse function, we have our lazy reverse complement function that just calls both of these and returns the result after calling both. And let's put this into practice. So I could have a DNA string in main, this is at the end of main, called, I don't know, DNA is ACCGAT. And let's print out what happens when I take the complement of DNA and I'll say this should print, well the complement is the complementary position without doing a reverse. So the complement of A is T and then we have CC so it's GG and then C and then uh, the complement of A is T and the complement of T is A. 
And then we can also print the reverse. And that should print out the symbols of DNA reversed. So that's T-A-G, C-C-A. And then we should also have the reverse complement. So it happens when we do both of these operations and we get the opposing strand of DNA. This should print what happens when we reverse and take the complement. You can do that in either order, but in this case, it's gonna be A, T, C, G, G, T. We're gonna print each of those three things just to make sure that everything is going okay and print those to the console. So I will compile after saving and I get that I is undefined. So I did something wrong. Um, here's where I do need an I in my ranging when I have the complement function. I think that's probably going to be it. Uh, unless I did the same thing in reverse. No, I'm okay there. Okay. So let's compile. And then let's run. And we see TGGCTA gets printed good. TAGCCA, that's what we'd hoped and ATCGGT. So at least on this small data set, everything is working. Of course, we should try it on a larger collection of data sets and make sure that there's not some other type of data set that where it's not working. But for now, I would say um, we're ready to go. And I'd make the final point that this is something we'll see throughout the course too. When I have this modular code by splitting things into subroutines, I have a complement function, I have a reverse function, and I thought about those two as independent separate tasks. That's easier for me to conceptualize and solve each of those problems. Imagine trying to do both of these tasks at the same time. It's also going to be easier to test functions like that. So I can just, if I just had an issue with the complementing, I could isolate that, but the reverse was okay, then I would know that or vice versa. That's going to be, help us become stronger programmers. And now I'd say it's your turn to test them. So you can test your functions further. Make sure that I didn't have another little bug in here in my own code. Um, but that's it for now. Hopefully I'll, you'll join me next time. We'll talk a little bit more about strings, get into the, sub, the idea of taking substrings and start looking at more sophisticated algorithms for analyzing genomes. But until then, happy coding.